Hello, and welcome to today's Friday Transportation Seminar. My name is Jennifer Dill, and I am the Director of the Transportation Research and Education Center at Portland State University, and I will be introducing and moderating today's seminar. Our Friday Transportation that transportation seminars have been a tradition since the year 2000. These seminars are usually held live on the Portland State University's urban campus that is located on the ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Wallala Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kailapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge that we are here because of the sacrifices forced on the indigenous ancestors of this place, remember these communities, and honor their legacy, lives, and descendants. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, today's seminar is hosted fully online. Today, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce Dr. Stephen Howland uh, to present his uh, PhD dissertation on transportation and gentrification impacts on low income black households in Portland. Last year, Stephen was awarded a PhD in urban studies from Portland State University. He focused on economic development, housing and their interaction with transportation. Currently, Stephen is an assistant economist with the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. At the Federal Reserve, he conducts research for the community development team with a focus on housing, jobs, digital divide, entrepreneurship, and access to credit. Before jumping into our final Friday Transportation Seminar of this academic year, I'd like to let you know about our upcoming um, National Institute of, for Transportation and Communities uh, webinar. And that will be coming up on May 11th. Um, and we'll have Professor Aaron Golub, who will be presenting uh, the results from a uh, NITSE funded project on eliminating cash options for public transit fares, cost benefits, and equity impacts. So before I turn it over to Stephen, um, just a quick overview of how things will work here. Um, you can expect um, our speaker to present for about 40 to 45 minutes, followed by Q&A. We do ask that you um, type your questions into the Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen, um, and we will ask those at the end of the presentation. If we do run out of time, we will share all your questions uh, with Stephen afterwards. Um, and uh, we have enabled closed captioning, but you must click on the closed captioning feature on your control panel to view them. We are also recording today's webinar and the recording will be available on the website later today, along with the presentation slides. And finally, if you are tracking professional development hours, this seminar is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit. So with that, I am very happy to hand it over to Dr. Howland. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Let me get my screen up. Okay. There we go. All right, thank you all for being here today and thank you, Trek and Jennifer for inviting me. Uh, as, as mentioned, uh, I am an assistant economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City right now. Uh, just wanted to reiterate the standard disclaimer that I have for my work is that today's presentation represents my views and not those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City or those of the Federal Reserve System. Um, so today's presentation is titled Transportation and Gentrification Impacts on Low-Income Black Households in Portland. This is a study I did for my dissertation, which was funded in part by the National Institute for Transportation and Communities Dissertation Fellowship. So I will start this presentation with an overview of my research questions and briefly go over my methods. I will then provide a general overview of Portland at the time of this study. Afterward, I'll present the findings of the study focusing on the transportation choices and the impact people and places had on transportation. I'll conclude with the implications of what I found uh, from this study. My research questions were two part. I asked what transportation choices are low income black Portlanders making and why? How do those choices affect their daily life? And what trade-offs do they make in deciding to use one mode over another? <clears throat> 
And I also ask how, about how gentrification has impacted their access to services and daily needs, as well as how it has impacted their interaction with and composition of their social support networks. From a very high level view, I found that East Portlanders struggled a lot more than those living in, in Albina. All of them, with all of them living in poverty, that meant that there was struggle all around for everyone that I interviewed. But East Portlanders faced the additional resource constraints due to where they lived. This was, this involved more difficulty in getting uh, places in terms of both money and time, as well as not having well-resourced support networks nearby. Even though Albina residents faced higher rents and low low cost food was further away, where they lived meant they had alternatives to getting around and they had well-resourced people they could turn to in times of need. I approached this study with a focus on how low-income black households made ends meet. So from this frame, from this focus and a vast reading of the literature, I developed this conceptual framework to make sense of the intricacies affecting how people get around and the places they go with an eye towards where they live, impacting the decisions they can make. The general idea here was that where someone lived impacted their proximity to various places they had to go to meet their needs, the transportation choices available to them, as well as their proximity to their social support network. The transportation options available to them impacted their ability to reach their social support network and the places they had to go to meet their daily needs. And then their social support network was important in being an additional place where they could meet some of their daily needs. But it is distinct from what we traditionally think of as being someplace someone goes for services. As I'll show in a little bit, administrative data does a poor job at being able to answer the questions I posed with this study. As such, I conducted a qualitative case study. I ultimately included 27 interviews in the study with about an even sample between, uh, between people living in Albina and those in East Portland to be able to evaluate the geographic issues of the black community in Portland. The sample was restricted to black populations of working age, earning less than about $35,000 and had children in the household. I recruited people through multiple mediums. I used flyers, churches, nonprofit organizations, an affordable housing provider, and snowball sampling. These all worked to varying degrees of, of success. The situation on the ground, unfortunately, uh, you know, made my positionality as a white male researcher more problematic in being able to recruit people. I was able to adapt to the situation and recruitment was ultimately successful to get to the uh, target number of people I wanted to interview, um, but it was definitely a struggle. Interviews on average were about one hour and participants were compensated $50 for their time. So this map shows general areas of, of my uh, research study. The Albina area roughly follows the, uh, the redlining map uh, of Albina in the, in the mid 1900s. Meanwhile, East Portland goes from about 82nd Avenue out into just, just into Gresham. Um, of the 27 people I recruited, East Portland and Albina residents showed some differences that led to a nuanced understanding of my findings later. East Portlanders were younger and tended to have younger kids. This contributed to some of their higher unemployment due to uh, taking off from work to be able to watch their, their kids due to the lack of other child care options they had, uh, or having just recently given birth, so they were on uh, maternity leave of different sorts. Albina residents were slightly more likely to have subsidized housing and were more likely to have always lived in that area. Their length of residency contributed to their rootedness in the area. This is something that I'll demonstrate uh, a little bit later. To understand why this research topic is important, it's important to understand what is going on in the Black community in Portland and what existing data could tell us. So as you can see from these maps, Portland has faced a massive amount of gentrification and displacement due to, to gentrification. 
Albina has flipped in 30 years from being the hub of the Black community and the harboring, harboring most of the Black population to losing half of its Black population while nearly doubling in white population. Meanwhile, East Portland became the landing spot for most of the displaced Black population, growing from about 2,000 Black people in 1990 to over 16,000 in 2017. Keeping in mind that in 2017, there were only about 43,000 Black people in Multnomah County. In terms of how low-income Black populations got around, administrative data was lacking. And, you know, the, there's a lot of reliability issues that come into play when looking at both income and race using uh, census data or other survey data. For instance, the Oregon Household Activity Survey surveyed too few Black people in Portland proper to be able to get a good idea of non-work trips. And the ACS is, can really only tell us that 60% of low-income Black workers commuted by driving and around 30% commuted by transit. But it can't tell us how or if that pattern varies by geography because the reliability of the data really collapses under uh, division by geography. Uh, even still, their commute mode share had a much different pattern than those of white commuters. Uh, but because the black population in Portland is relatively small overall, only about 5% of the population, it's generally the white experience that and getting around that tends to drive policy making around transportation. As such, the study looks to fill that gap in knowledge to some extent. I aim to center the low income black experience in transportation policy as their experience is not included to the extent it perhaps should be. Um, for the first set of questions focus on transportation, I found a uh, big divide in mode based on those that drove and those that used transit. I'll go through their findings individually. But their stories of getting around were always influenced by where they lived and their various life circumstances. And I'm gonna be sharing some of those stories as I go through this. For example, Amber was a single mother of two living in the Northern section of Albina. She lived with a roommate, another single mother. They split rent of, of $2,240 a month plus utilities. For nearly, with her nearly 40 hour a week job at a fast food restaurant earning $11 an hour, she was spending nearly 70% of her paycheck on rent. Adding to her struggles, she had a disability that made standing for hours on end day after day exhausting and painful. In order to cope, she cut back on hours at work to save, to have the energy at the end of the day to take care of her kids. She had been on a, a waiting list for public housing for three years and recently found out she was a top candidate for a subsidized apartment in one of Portland's suburbs, a very distant, distant and different place from where she currently lived. Even though living further out would likely be cheaper for her, uh, she continued to suffer from a massive rent burden in order to keep her son in a, his school where he was comfortable and the teachers knew his quirks. She constantly worried about any disruptions in her life that may break that stability for her son and send him off course in school. Even when she was homeless and sleeping on a family member's couch in Gresham, she commuted to North Portland to take her son to school. She just wanted to have that stability for her kids. Getting around, Amber relied on driving a very rundown van she bought from her uncle on a family loan. She gave him money whenever she could, but she often did not have anything extra. Driving was very expensive for her. It added a considerable amount of stress as well because she knew at any moment her van could break down. She got by putting in $5 of gas at a time because she just didn't want to put any money into gas and then have her van break down and then be out that, that money. Much of her decision to drive was because her kids, because of her kids and her work schedule. Her daughter was too young to ride the bus to school alone, and she just didn't feel comfortable letting her son ride the bus to school on his own. Instead, she chauffeured her kids to and from school. Between her kids' start time at school and her work schedule, she is often late for work. Thankfully, her management was was uh, pretty responsive to her needs, but if she was to take transit, it'd be impossible, and her management would never be able to would never be able to forgive the amount of lateness that she'd be if she was on transit. And additionally, at least one night a week, she had to work past midnight, but working that shift meant she'd be stranded if relying on the bus. And 
as it had stopped running by the time she got out of the store. Her driving also came with a great risk. She was on license. She had a suspended license due to the offenses long in her past, but she just hadn't been able to pay off the fines. She also had no insurance. Combined, this meant being pulled over by the police could mean going to jail, losing her van, potentially her kids, or as we all well know from the news stories of the past few years, even worse. And every person I talked to had some level of relation to Amber's story whether they primarily drove or used transit. This slide is a summary of the findings of the transportation choice section of my study. Um, we're just gonna go through this really quickly and, and get into more on just drivers uh, to start with, but there is nearly a universal dislike of transit for both drivers and regular transit users. This largely related to their feelings of safety using transit. East Portlanders gain marginally more benefit from car ownership than those in Albina, but the cost of ownership is a huge barrier for them. And even with the, the dislike of transit, it was a preferred backup mode for drivers in case something happened to their car. Meanwhile, transit users were more likely to turn to asking for rides. And because of the lack of alternatives to getting around, East Portlanders had to cut a lot more from their lifestyle and their budget in order to afford getting around. So drivers noted a number of positives and negatives with their choice of mode. Driving was by far the most convenient mode. They expanded their choices of where, uh, where they can meet their daily needs and it made it easier in getting around with their kids. However, driving was very expensive. It added a lot of stress to their da daily lives and especially when it came to dealing with traffic and the cost. Both of those added a considerable amount of stress to, to their choice of driving. So as said, you know, this is demonstrated a lot by uh, what Jacqueline mentioned here. So if she talks about how, you know, if she's gonna be carrying things, she doesn't wanna do that taking transit. And if it's, you know, something that she could easily catch a single line to, then she's probably gonna be more likely to to go to the grocery store on that single line. But there's another grocery store she goes to that takes two or three buses, and there's no way she's gonna do that, so instead she's gonna drive. She is one of, one of a couple of people that I interviewed that had about an even amount where she drove and used transit. So it's an interesting uh, case to kind of look at there. And while a vast literature extols the benefits of car ownership for low-income households and being able to find work, especially higher paying jobs, few people in the study actually drove long distances in order to get work. Indeed, they always made their job decisions based on its accessibility to transit. This was in part due to the reliability of their vehicle, but it's also because the majority of participants were single mothers who have historically been shown to not travel far from home for work because of childcare responsibilities. Having a car was also an insurance policy for them, knowing their employment was precarious. At any time, they may lose their job and having a car would give them more options of employment. And you know, this is demonstrated by what Don, Don mentions here. You know, finding a job a mile or two off, off the transit line, is, it just makes it untenable. He couldn't, he couldn't take that risk. And again, cars came with a large cost. Uh, the cost of car ownership among the people I interviewed was on average about $300 per month, but the range was quite wide, going from $70 a month to $500 a month. Uh, even still, none of them accounted for regular maintenance or emergency fixes in their budget. So if something happened, they were, they were without a car for quite some time. In order to afford the cost of driving, they tend to limit how much they traveled first and foremost. That, that constraint of mobility is factored into to their ability to even afford getting around. And this is, uh, you know, they regularly cut back on expenses in order to have the money to pay for their vehicle. Given the precarious nature of living in poverty, some months or even weeks were worse than others in terms of finances, and that meant cutting deeper at those time, times. 
That meant putting off travel altogether until they got paid, cutting out certain grocery items or decreasing the quality of what they bought or putting off other bills. They did whatever they had to in order to remain mobile. And you can get a sense of that by what Derek explained in, in his situation. There was always some errand he had to run, especially when it came to the kids. Driving was the only way to accomplish it all. He even cut a lot from his budget in order to afford driving, but he's had little, he's, he felt he's had little success in being able to make headway there and, and affording his car. It's a constant stressor for him. And if people lost their, their car, their lives were upended. They had arranged their lives around being able to drive, their job, their kids, their shopping choices. Basically, their entire lives were oriented around being able to drive. And as Amber said here, she would likely become homeless again if she had to rely on transit. And, you, know, you can start to see how all these things can, you know, the precarity of their work, their transportation choices and just their general ability to orient everything around their lives, around how they get around, it can collapse in, in a moment. Drivers were also very hesitant to use transit, not just because of the inconvenience of it. Safety was the number one reason they stated for why they did not want to be on transit again. At the time I was doing my interviews, Jeremy Christian killed two people and stabbed another, all of whom had confronted him to get him to stop harassing two girls of color with racial epithets. This incident put a great deal of fear into my participants as that summer had been filled with incidents of racism and rising elements of white supremacy. Even without that incident, their feelings of safety on transit were generally negative. Uh, between incidents with people experiencing homelessness and people with suspected mental illness and su substance abuse issues, they had absolutely no desire to get on transit. And as Margaret stated here in, in this quote, it affects her willingness to let her kids on transit and likely affecting her kids' likelihood of being future transit users. And, and in terms of the transit, I have another story to start us off with. So Denise lived in the heart of East Portland, about a mile from the Max line on Burnside. Every day she would hop on the bus to get to the Max station and ride the train for an hour to get to work in Beaverton. Her trip home had her detour to Albina to pick up her daughter from after school activities. In total, she commuted about three hours a day on transit, provided everything on transit was working as it should, which often it was not. Luckily, her employer paid her for paid for her transit pass, so she really faced difficulty in getting around because of cost. However, she was un unwittingly paying for her daughter daughter's transit rides, even though her daughter qualified for school passes through Portland Public Schools. At the same time, though, she didn't want to be riding transit anymore, and even more so, didn't want her kids riding it anymore. Safety on transit was a huge concern for her, leading her to take defensive maneuvers, such as avoiding transit at night and preventing engagement with others. She had also been riding transit all her life, struggled through using it, and wanted better for her kids. Transit also limited her range of daily life, uh, life activities. She was unable to shop for groceries at her preferred grocery stores because of difficulties catching transit to them. Her oldest son lived in Vancouver, and her bus dependency has substantially limited her ability to see him. And while there were some some positives in that you know they could easily find affordable housing on transit lines, there was a lot of negatives to it. And there's a general feeling of taking transit was a necessary evil because they had no other choice. And one of those issues was just bus reliability. Uh, it is a chronic problem, and as Troy demonstrates here in this quote, while bus trip times are typically measured in the time it takes to get from origin to destination, they rarely take into account the measures people use in order to ensure the bus they take gets them to where they want to go on time. Like Troy, it was common for transit user, users to arrive to the bus stop a bus before they would need to in order to ensure they arrive at their destination on time. That means they're taking more time out of their day in order to catch transit and ensure that they can get their, to their destination when they need to. And while I've mentioned transportation, transit safety multiple times now, the concerns of those I interviewed was not just about safety on transit, 
even the walk to the bus stop had issues. This was primarily true for those in East, East Portland. As Destiny mentioned here, she she equipped herself with several defensive techniques to feel safe using transit, including carrying mace and always being aware of, of her surroundings. But nobody in Albina expressed issues of getting to her from the bus stop. Even so, they would still curtail their nighttime use because of the perceived danger. And while drivers opted to opted to avoid transit, transit users didn't have the ability to avoid using it. This was the option they had available to them to be able to reliably uh, get around. But like Darius said here, you know, he was describing a particular incident that he experienced while riding uh, riding the Max, where he felt he had to toss a guy off, off the train and deal with him. Uh, it was one of many incidents he encountered while using transit. There's also some uh, similar situation that many others shared with me. Not all of them were, you know, dealing with with the people, but they experienced many similar situations. And transit does have a big impact on their employment. You know, people would not take jobs that weren't accessible by transit. They couldn't, they just couldn't figure out a way to make it work uh, if it wasn't accessible. And even having access wasn't enough. So uh, like Troy's experience here, he could get he could get to his job uh, during the day, but he'd be working later into the night and then transit stopped running. And you know, then he is left with paying somebody five dollars to take him to the max every day, spending twenty-five dollars a week just to get home. And that's on top of his regular transit fare. Uh, he just couldn't find a way to make that situation sustainable. And because he was a temp worker, he had to gauge his job assignments based on whether he could get to them reliably. He'd often go long stints without work because the only jobs available to him were inaccessible by transit. He also experienced more stable employment that paid well, but you know, this was the this uh, situation he's describing in this quote, that was one of the better paying jobs. He just couldn't find a way to make it work. The people I interviewed described many limiting factors to being dependent on transit. Destinations was a big one. The destinations they could and could not access meant a difference in time and money uh, they would spend. For instance, Paying someone for a ride would allow them to shop for more groceries than they would otherwise be able to carry on transit. Grocery shopping in particular was difficult and expensive because low cost stores were not available in Albina. And more often than not, for those living in East Portland, they were just too far away. And that meant having to shop at the more expensive nearby store. And much like Vanessa described here, she felt she was getting half as much food as she could if she, if she were able to reach a Winco or Costco. And then there's just the general cost of transit. It wasn't easy for a lot of people to afford. Uh, annual pass at the time of the study was $100 a month, $5 a day, or $2.50 for two hours. To give a sense of the level of struggle for those that were transit dependent, they made the same cutbacks in their daily lives as drivers did, but their cuts were made to afford bus fare, at least a third of the cost of what people were spending on driving. And like Joseph said here, you have to keep in mind that everywhere you go, that's $5. And this is because few bought or were provided monthly passes and as such relied on day-to-day -day passes. This is important to keep in mind that the uh, low income fare at the, at, hadn't been implemented at the time and the, uh, the unique pass situation that TriMet has in place now that also wasn't in, in, in place at the time of the study. So there have been changes that would kind of change this calculus for people, but you know, it's still something that people have to keep in mind that every time they get on a bus, that's money out of their pocket. And it's not something that people keep in mind when they get in their car. Getting rides was also very important in maintaining their mobility. Drivers rarely ask it, asked for a ride as it was assumed that because they had a car, they didn't need a ride. Transit riders, however, relied on getting on the alternative of getting rides, but it wasn't an easy ask. 
like Tanya said here. As she described, asking for a ride meant being at the mercy of the person they asked. They, that person could say no. You had to be much more flexible on your time. And those rides often came with a cost. And even though it was much less than a taxi would cost them, it's still money out of their pocket that was going to be more expensive than transit. And getting rides wasn't an evenly, evenly distributed ability either. East Portlanders struggled to find reliable rides. Few people they knew with a car lived in East Portland, and albino people were rarely willing to come to East Portland to give them a ride. To give an idea of the struggles faced by transit mode and where someone lived, I put together this chart. I used the number of people who said something was limited as well as their description of the severity of the limitation to gauge how much of a barrier they faced. And as you can see, East Portlanders struggled a lot more to get around than those in Albina, regardless of the mode that they were using. And driving was costlier there because of the distance, distances between destinations. Transit just took a whole lot more time and connected with, to fewer places. And getting rides was just more difficult. I'm going to get into the places and people piece of this. This is much more about the gentrification issue uh, at study here. And being able to obtain services and goods easily, as well as having outlets for entertainment and stress relief, are important for maintaining daily life. Goods and services come from both destinations and people. For this study, I focused on a variety of destinations uh, and focused on you know, not just the, the social support network and the rely, reliance on, on the people they knew, but also how how they were feeling about the people around them and the neighborhood that they lived in. And you know, the, the, these things create community for them. You know, and they they look at these at places and people as part of how how you know part of their livelihood. And as people moved around, those pieces of the community and both destinations and people eroded. As demonstrated by a story here from Carol. Carol found living in Albino was an important part of her life, but its importance was declining. It was where she grew up and it developed roots, it was where her son was in a school that accommodated his disability. And moving further away would jeopardize his ability to stay in that school. She still went to Dean's Beauty Salon, one of the few one of the few good uh, black beauty salons in, in Albino. And she'd been going there since day one. The church she grew up going to, Emmanuel Church, was still there. Uh, even though she's she's uh, not going to church anymore, she still appreciates it's still there. Um, Albina meant a lot to her, and she meant a lot to the area as well, as she provided free childcare to her sister, neighbors, and friends. Working for a restaurant delivery app allowed her the flexibility to offer the child care and spend the time she wanted with her son. She also realized she'd not be able to live, live in Albina if it were not for subsidized housing. And she had always lived in Albina with the exception of a short stint in St. John's in the Northwest of Albina. However, Carol's roots in Albina were clearly eroding. Most of the places she grew up knowing were gone. While a lot of people relied on her, she had no one left in Albina she could rely on including her sister. Everyone else had moved to Gresham. Her experience with newcomers to Albina made her feel alienated from the area she called home. Carol was fraught with doubt about how much longer she had, she had considered Albina home. And she was not alone in feeling disconnected from the community she most identified with. There are several important findings from this part of the study, much are related to how gentrification is eroding the black community and uh, albinos wants known for, but it was also more than that. Gentrification also meant not having places that catered towards those with lower incomes. Even so, those living in albino were uh, able to easily get to places and have stronger connections to friends and family that were still living nearby. They were much less socially isolated than those living in East Portland. And these all have consequences for uh, both those living in Albina and in East Portland. So grocery stores were clearly the most important destination people had to get to. The choice was dependent on how, how they could get to the grocery store, though. 
If they drove or could get a ride, they could get to their preferred store. However, without that convenience, they mostly turned to the closest store, and that store was never their preferred store. The ability to get rides and having access to a car was evident in Albina residents' incidents of going to East Portland for groceries. This was almost entirely going to Winco, uh, which was located at 102nd and Halsey, over 80 blocks away from Albina. So this was an option that was mostly reserved to those living in Albina and had a car. East Portlanders were about split between low-cost grocers and others, and that was almost entirely dependent on proximity and being able to drive. Transit users in East Portland were spending anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes to get to a grocery store on the bus, uh, whereas people that were driving, they, they had a wide array of, of places they can go. And to kind of give more context to that, I have some maps here showing the grocery store locations for within the study areas. And you see that the options available here in Albina were New Seasons, Whole Foods, and Safeway, and Fred Meyer. And while Safeway and Fred Meyer, those are, you know, a little bit more affordable, they weren't the low-cost groceries that folks were really clamoring for. Meanwhile, in East Portland, you're looking at a much bigger area. The scale of this map has grown uh, three times. So we went from one mile scale to a three mile scale, going from Albina to East Portland, just to give you an idea that this is a much bigger area. And while there are a whole lot more stores out here, they are very dispersed. And it would take a lot for a lot of people to be able to get to the store that they wanted to or even just any store in general, depending on where they lived. And for example, Derek lived on the eastern edge of the East Portland study area. He'd have to go four miles to get to Winco. And as he stayed here, he'd love to have a, a cheaper store near, nearby. You know, switching gears to another destination that was important to people, you know, churches were a really big part of the Black community, and you know, most of the Black churches in Portland are still located in, in Albina, but some have uprooted and moved, moved to East. You can start to see some of those patterns and how people reacted, have really remained attached to, to the churches through, uh, through this chart. Um, Nearly a third of the people I interviewed no longer went to church, but the vast majority did and attended one with a primarily black congregation. Churches in Albina were still the go-to for half of half the East Portland uh, churchgoers, and the others were going to Highland Christian, which moved to East in order to be closer to its congregation due to gentrification. And most East Portlanders going to church in Albina relied on church transportation or family to get to the church. If it weren't for those options, they likely wouldn't go to church anymore. As I mentioned, place is also affected by the people in the area, whether or not they're part of their social support network or not. And in Albina, the newcomers to the neighborhood were not always of the most welcoming nature. Uh, Carol explained it this way. I feel like an alien now. I feel weird, like I'm not supposed to be here anymore. Like, especially in Alberta sometimes when I do deliveries for Postmates, it's weird because the whole area is not what it used to be. And so now I'm an alien when it used to be vice versa. And now it's just, I just look around and I feel like I'm in some other place. Like I don't even feel like where I grew up anymore. It's weird, just weird. And I feel like I wouldn't be so, it wouldn't be so bad maybe if these white people would maybe be more friendly and say, hi, how are you? But they just act like I don't exist. I felt like this was, this is my area. Why do I feel, why, why do you come here? At least say hi. Or I don't know, it's just weird. So yeah, it's just crazy. I feel sad. And you know, it, it used to be when I was when I was growing up, I would go to the store or different places or something like that. I would always see people I know. But now it's nobody. Nobody. It's just sad. You know, sometimes here and there, but it's not really like it used to be. It's just weird. Meanwhile, in East Portland, Gail had similarly negative feelings about the newcomers to East Portland. Albina used to be known for his gang problems, violence, drug issues, a lot like many of the uh, historically segregated neighborhoods across the U.S. 
But due to the various rounds of urban renewal and gentrification, those problems have largely shifted east along with the people that have been displaced from Albina. And as Gail describes it, it just feels like everybody there is mad. Now, and it's not just the black people, it's just everybody. It just feels like everybody is mad in East Portland. To give an idea about how their social support networks were distributed and how they relied on them, I created this, this chart that uh, tracks where people were living that they were relying on and how reliant they were on them. And you know, social support networks were a huge determinant in the amount somebody struggled to get by. If their social support network was either non-existent or unreliable, they had nowhere they could turn if they needed someone to watch their kid, get a ride, get a little bit of cash to get through a tough time, or even just someone to talk to. And for those living in Albina, gentrification impacted their support network by moving their network further east to the point it was difficult to rely on those people anymore. And you can see that, you know, there is about half the Albina residents, you know, they still have connections in East Portland, but they're not relying on them at all. They're relying mostly on those that are still living in Albina. And those living in East Portland, you know, they are relying on people in East Portland, but a lot of their connections are still, still in Albina and they're still trying as best they can to rely on, on folks in Albina. And that's mostly because the people in Albina were much more well-resourced. They had the cars, they had, they had stable housing, they had, a little bit of money to spare. They weren't finding that with people they knew in East Portland. Carol relied a lot on her mom for various aspects of her life. You know, this is just another story to kind of demonstrate you know, how these social support networks can impact our lives. And you know, her mom used to live just a few blocks away when she was in Albion, and she could go see her anytime she wanted. But her mom has since moved east to Gresham. It has essentially cut her off from one of the few people she could rely on as the rest of her family has also moved east. But it also affects her son as he won't be able to grow up with the same kind of relationship with his grandma as he otherwise would have. And you know, those with, with better social support networks were most likely to be better off. You know, they were better off for having a strong social support network. They had someone they could reliably call upon for a ride to the grocery store, somebody that could they could ask to watch their kid while they picked up a shift at work. They had somebody who would drop off money or food, somebody they, they could regularly talk to on the phone. The reality I found was that those who had those kinds of relationships were those living in Albina. No one really had that good of a network while living in East Portland, and their East Portland counterparts just weren't able to provide the kind of help they needed and that they could find from those they knew in Albina. And the distance barrier there between, you know, going from East Portland to Albina to be able to get that, that assistance they, they needed from their support network was a massive barrier. It's a lot of time and money, and they still needed, they still needed to tack on the extra time they needed to do the tasks they, they were trying to do for asking for help. Like, you know, if they were asking for childcare help, so they could go pick up a shift at work. They had to go to Albina, drop off their kid, then make it to work. I mean, this is just additional cost on top of them to be able to, to uh, get this assistance. Places and people clearly matter to meeting their, uh, to people's abilities to meet their daily needs. Having people nearby that were accommodating gave albino residents a particular life advantage unavailable to those living in East Portland. And this affects those in East Portland, not only financially, but psychologically. It can feel, create a feeling of never being able to catch a break or being able to get ahead. And there are several limitations in understanding what it is that I found here. Um, just to put this in context a little bit, the uh, results I presented here are what I found for the sample I selected and are highly dependent upon the context of the place and time of the study. You know, I knew from the outset of this study that getting enough geographic representation of people in East Portland was going to be difficult. You know, it, there's a lot of area to cover in the Black population being as small as it is and then dispersing across all that area 
is going to be very difficult to to find that. And you know, because of already difficult situation in recruiting po uh, populations for the study, you know, it just added to to that difficulty in recruiting people and having geographic representativeness in East Portland. And with as important as social support networks were in the outcomes of the study, I can't say with certain certainty the intricacies of how social support networks function to improve the livelihoods of the people I interviewed because I'm not, I didn't interview multiple people in the same uh, same social support network, so I don't know how the stories all match up and what the resources are that are available. When I was conducting the study, the interviews for the study, racism and white supremacy were high on the minds of people I interviewed. It took a lot of work to not just get people to trust me, but also to get past their reactions to some of the events that went on. I think I accounted for this well, but it's hard to know for sure how much of their heightened sense of fear on transit was exacerbated by the attack on the Max. I tried many different tactics to try to get beyond that, but there's just a certain point where he, I could feel that it was influencing some of their answers, but I tried to tease that out as much as I possibly could. And shortly after I conducted the interviews, as I mentioned, TriMet instituted their low income fare. They added transit line on 162nd Avenue. They increased frequencies on other, other lines in East Portland. And these would all clearly have positive effects on the people I interviewed, but I can't say how much those changes helped or in what ways. And just a few of the biggest impacts I see from the study. Uh, the study has clear implications for how we talk about how people are impacted by policies that support the dispersal of poverty. We have always known there's no clear line to draw in the sand one way or another, but dispersing people in poverty without giving them the choice has substantial impacts on their life chances, especially so when that dispersal means they are removed from a neighborhood they grew up in, from the people they rely on to get by with meager wages, and the places for which they identify as part of their culture and being. This study adds evidence to, of gentrification as violence against people of color. The ways in which gentrification separated people from their homes, their support networks, and the chance at making it out of poverty exhibited real harm to the people I talked to. And this more than offsets any positives that can be gained from gentrification. In terms of housing policy, it's, cl it's clear policy needs to account for the lived experience from people affected by, by the policy. And even though gentrification was not a housing policy per se, it was abetted by housing and planning practices. Uh, practices that allowed the runaway gentrification to occur for so long and no policies put in place really to limit the effects of it uh, once it was recognized. And affordable housing uh, being implemented now in Albina can only go so far at this point. Gentrification has taken hold and taken over so much of, of Albina that it can only have a limited impact. And Section 8 vouchers have a notoriously resegregating effect. So now, we have to be cautious in how we're looking at addressing you know, the, the housing needs of, of those being displaced and being uh, harmed by the rent increases in the Albina area. And the people displaced by gentrification uh, and just people living in poverty in general need real help. You know, universal vouchers could go a long way as currently Section 8 vouchers only reach about a fifth of the population that currently qualifies for them. But also landlords need to be compelled to cooperate. Too many landlords just won't accept somebody who's trying to pay for rent with a, with a housing voucher. And transit, while improving to Portland, improving in Portland to some extent, still has a long way to go for those most in need and particularly low income black populations. The transit system is not set up to easily connect them with decent paying jobs in warehouses and factories on the outskirts of the city. Additionally, the large distances between homes and destinations in East Portland means transit at normal speeds with frequent stops bogs down the ability to really utilize transit to its greatest extent. That people in East Portland curtail their trips because they cannot accomplish as much in a day means something really needs to change there. Lastly, the feeling of safety needs to be improved on transit system, system wide. TriMet has suffered from lost ridership as a result of their captive riders moving to areas where transit is less available. And the safety issues are only further inhibiting ridership. Now, Opal suggested that TriMet revive their rider advocate program where non-uniform staff ride on buses and act as, as eyes to intervene in, in conflicts and to offer advice to riders on 
how to get where they're wanting to go. This is one possible direction to go, but any policy to address safety needs to take into account the ways police, police react in distinctly different ways to different populations. And you know, the direction for that Opal is proposing may be the, the way to go. It may be another way. I'm not an expert on policing or creating safety, but you know, the community needs to be involved in those decisions. And especially so when considering the the impacts that we've seen of policing on uh, communities of color. That concludes my presentation. All right, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, we've got some good questions coming in. I want to remind people um, to put their questions in the Q and A box. Um, and I'm going to start out, there's a few questions that get more at the methodology, so I'm going to start out with those, and I, I think this is a good example of, of some of the value of doing qualitative research. Um, and so one question has to do with your sample size. So, you know, with qualitative research, um, you're going to have fewer people um, that you're able to talk with. And so how do you deal with that issue of having a sort of a smaller sample than in a large scale um, uh, study and particularly in maybe talking with policymakers or decision makers and um, making recommendations? How would you approach that limitation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're always going to have a, a much smaller sample size in a qualitative research uh, project. Um, it's just by virtue of, of the amount of hours it takes to conduct something like this. And, but you get really rich information that you wouldn't from doing something like a survey. And one of the ways to control for, you know, the, the issues you face with a smaller sample size is to try to control for as many factors as you can. So one of the things I did when approaching this study was try to limit who it was that I was looking for. So I limited it to specifically uh, black populations, those earning under a certain amount of money, those that had children in the household, those that were currently uh, in the labor force, whether they were working or unemployed at some point. So, you know, I'm eliminating a lot of potential stories there uh, that I could be telling right now. But by controlling for those, I'm really narrowing down the, the potential uh, the potential externalities that could influence what it is that's, that I'm looking for. And you know, there's a lot of value in looking at those other questions, but by controlling for that, I can really contain the story and get more variation in just that segment of the story that I'm looking for. So getting that rich detail on those particular stories is what can really help us in forcing forward you know, potential policy solutions and looking more in depth at particular things that come up from these stories. And I feel there's a lot of value to that that you just wouldn't ever get from doing survey research or uh, something larger. Okay, and um, you did uh, um, during your presentation mention how your positionality as a white person doing this research, um, how that impacted things. And um, could, is there any more you want to expand in terms of sort of what you experienced and what techniques did you use to mitigate the effects of your positionality? Yeah. Um... It was a really difficult time to be, be a white male researcher studying the black community in Portland. Um, you know, a lot of those, a lot of that uh, substance is still on the ground in Portland, so it is still something that will face researchers there currently. Um, one of the things that that I offer as advice to anybody, you know, in a similar positionality as I am, trying to do something similar, is you know, work with intermediaries, work with the nonprofit organizations, work with housing providers, build the trust with them because they're going to be your critical gatekeepers because it's the community you're looking for that trusts them. And if you can get those organizations to trust you, it really opens the door to a lot of, a lot of uh, possibilities there. Um, I unfortunately didn't do as much of that groundwork as I really should have when I first started up and it really set me back when all these events started going off. And you know, it, it took me quite a while to adjust to that. And like I got phone calls 
you know, from from people saying, "Hey, these these flyers are a problem. You can't have them up in our in our neighborhood." Like we're getting reports of of uh, white supremacists putting up flyers targeting targeting our community, and and they're not uh, they're seeing your flyers as well, and they're they're really concerned. So I had you know, luckily I I had actually gone through and I. I made sure I had a marker on a map for every flyer that I put out so I could go back out and remove every one of the flyers I put up. Great. But like being able to, to adapt to that is, it was intense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so you, you talked a little bit about social networks um, and you did talk about limiting your sample, but we have a question, um, were you able to dive at all into sort of looking at differences between um, different household types and so married couples versus one person or multi-generational. Did you see any differences there? Unfortunately, I didn't have a big enough sample to really dig into the into those kinds of differences. I do feel there are some differences there. Um, but in a lot of cases, there was still a lot of struggle among those that were in married couples. Um, you know, both of them working in low wage jobs, it, it still creates a really tough situation for their families. Um, so there's certainly something there to look into. I don't have good answers to that because I just didn't have that many. Uh, as I mentioned, most of, most of my sample ended up being uh, single mothers. So. Okay. And um, we have a question about whether or not you would ascribe any of the differences in urban form between Albina and East Portland. And if that you think had any effect on social networks. And I think this also relates, I'm gonna tie in another question about um, transfers in transit and the difference between the two areas and the difficulty there. Yeah, urban form definitely had a huge impact. Um, you know, the, the urban form of, of East Portland, while it was still very urbanized, it was still very dense in population, it had, it developed in a way that was very suburban. So there's a lot of dead in the streets and a lot of gravel roads and, and just, there's a lot of things there that just don't create a good environment to walk. And whether you're walking to a destination or walking to the bus stop, it creates a lot of, a lot of difficulties there. And you know that that does create you know issues in how much time it takes to get to the bus stop, and you know how many um, how many various directions you have to consider that you can go to be able to get to where you're, where it is you're trying to go. And the suburban form there, because of how commercial uh, is developed out in East Portland in particular, you know it created pockets of commercial. So you see big pocket of commercial there along uh, along the 205 highway. And you know that's where a lot of the low cost grocers were. So for a lot of people in East Portland, it would be two bus transfers to be able to get to, to a grocery store or you know it would take them just ages to be able to, to get there on, on on transit. And you know even driving there is just a, is a long distance for somebody who's trying to account for every penny they're spending on gas. Um, so the urban form in East Portland really, really impacted how, you know, the amount of struggle that they faced in trying to get around out there. Okay, great. And um, let's see, there's, there's more questions than we have time for, but I, I think some of these may have been answered in your last few slides because a couple of them came in. Um, but I think a good one to end on is sort of the future and particularly your work. And if you um, plan to stay connected with the community, I mean, we know that you're actually not in the Portland area anymore, um, but, um, and um, also a small thing, were people compensated? Um, I'm sure they were, but you can confirm that. And um, sort of what, um, if you've stayed connected with the community and you've sort of shared the information back with the community um, to benefit them. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I haven't been able to reach back out to the community partners I work with. It's, it's been a wild ride from, you know, so I, I defended my dissertation almost a year ago to the day today because uh, I defended on May 1st last year, 
and you know clearly we were in the middle of a pandemic <laughs> and you know i i moved twice last year both within the kansas city area and started up this this new job uh with the federal reserve and i just i just haven't had the time um you know it, it's something that that continues to be on the back of my mind of like i i need to do something with this to create you know a really really quick policy fact sheet something to share out with with community partners and you know it's it's been a struggle because there's just so much information i want to share and you know as, as you see i have 40 minute presentation here and i still didn't share everything that i could have um so it, it's been a struggle and i just haven't haven't uh dedicated the time to do it yet unfortunately so Okay. Well, uh, I will say that uh, we at TREC will um, help you um, do that. And I think this seminar is a first way um, of getting information out um, about your work. So, um, and I think all of us sympathize with um, all <laughs> the things that are going on in our lives and not being able to do everything that we want. Um, so with that, I really want to thank um, Stephen for his presentation today. Um, um, and um, remind everyone, if you haven't already, sign up for our newsletter so you can hear about more events. And when you um, sign off today, you're going to get a quick survey uh, that we would appreciate you filling out. It really helps us a lot in um, planning future events and giving feedback to our speakers. Um, so with that, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everybody.